Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the FSAI's Breakfast Bite, Pest Control in Your Food Business. I'm Emma, and I'll be your host for the event this morning. So we've three really interesting speakers for you. Ruth Confrey, FSAI, Philip Devnish, Environmental Health Service, and Michael Lachlan, Irish Pest Control Association. So firstly, you'll hear from Ruth. Ruth is the Training and Compliance Manager here in the FCI, and Ruth will outline the rise in pest control issues associated with recent food safety enforcements and the responsibility of food business operator to ensure your premises is protected from pests. So then you'll hear from Philip Devnish, who'll speak about effective pest control. And during Philip's talk, he'll look at some of the reasons why food businesses need a pest control regime and explore what a good set of procedures looks like in contrast to examples of bad practice that lead to negative outcomes for some food businesses. And finally, Michael Lachlan, Irish Pest Control Association, will speak on best practice for pest management and outline what your pest control operator should be delivering to ensure your food premises is protected from pests. And also my colleague, Elaine Gibson, is here um, in the wings. Should anything go wrong, she's um, going to ensure everything runs smoothly this morning. So thank you very much, Elaine. And we're very pleased so many of you could join us today. The webinar will last 40 minutes in total, so 30 minutes for the presentations, followed by 10 minutes at the end, which will give us some time for questions and answers. So if you do have any questions for our speakers, you can pop them in the questions box on your screen throughout the talk, and we'll do our best to get to them all at the end. And lastly, if you're on social media, please do let us know at hashtag FSAI events. And now I'll hand you over to Ruth. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much, Emma. Um, it's great to, to be here this morning to present to you. It's good to see so many people logged on to um, listen to our pest control webinar. So I'm going to talk to you about the, um, the rise in pest control enforcement. OK, and I'm sure all of you have seen um, headings such as this in the newspapers um, over the last few months, you know, really um, quite serious findings in some of the inspections that have taken place. OK, so um, just want to uh, talk a little bit about these enforcements. So these headlines refer to the enforcements that are taken under the FSA Act over the past number of months. And these, in, these enforcements are taken by inspectors working in the health service executive and other agencies. So the environmental health officer that I'm sure many of you are familiar with who carry out inspections in your food businesses. When there's an issue or a non-compliance that would present a grave and immediate danger to the public, the inspector can issue a closure notice. And that closure notice essentially shuts the premises until such time as the issue or the non-compliance is rectified to the satisfaction of the inspector. So looking at the statistics that we have for the last four months, you can see there, um, when we say 100% of closure orders in January had a pest control aspect to it, it means that one of the elements of non-compliance related to pest control. Now, there were a few where there was just pure pest control um, issues that resulted in a clear, a clear non-compliance, and that resulted in a closure order for the business. Okay, So you can see there in January, it was 100%. In December, it was 50%. And then back up again to 100% in both November and October this year. So obviously the winter time, more of a time for pests to be active within premises. They're looking like all of us for somewhere warm. So obviously a, a big issue there. But one of the things we've also seen is an increase in the severity of the pest control issues being identified by the inspectors, such as Philip, who we'll be talking to later. So perhaps in the past, we would have seen things like non-compliances um, around evidence of pest droppings in the storeroom. And that would be evidence of pest control issues in the premises. But now we've seen some of these enforcements related to where the inspector actually witnessed a live rat in the kitchen. So actually in the food preparation area, a live rat was seen. And this is more severe because it shows that the level of infestation in the premises that the rat is out and active during the daytime when the inspector was there when there's activity there and not just at night time or not just in the ancillary areas or in the yard areas so this is something and this is one of the reasons that we've developed this pest control breakfast bite for businesses so we're just going to do a poll now so the poll is asking you have you had a pest control issue in your business in the past four months and the poll will be launched there now you can see it coming up on your screen and look we're asking you to answer honestly we're not going to be looking to see who answered what or anything like that but just to see 
how many businesses here today this morning have had pest control issues over the last four months and i can see the results starting to come in there now okay so if you haven't answered just click in whether you have yes and if you haven't no so it's looking around about 66 percent haven't had and 34 percent have had okay so um 34 percent of you here are this is obviously very timely for you you've had a very recent pest um issue in your premises and for the rest of you that are here hopefully this will share some learning with you from the inspectorate viewpoint from pest controllers viewpoint to help you prevent having any pest control issues in your premises okay so thank you for that. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about good pest control and, and just to point out that it is the responsibility of a food business to produce safe food. And that includes having effective pest control procedures in place. So it includes your physical premises, your operational hygiene, and also regular checks for pest activity. And this is not to be left solely to your pest control contractor who comes in once every four weeks or whatever. This is something that staff need to do every single day, every time they're in the premises, every time they're putting the bins out, every time they're in the storeroom, they need to be keeping an eye out for any pest issues that are happening. So what we're talking about here is making sure your building is in good repair, okay? Good condition, good repair, no holes in the walls, no um, gaps at the end of doors, things like that, making sure that everything is nice and tightly sealed, that there's no access points that rats and mice could get into the premises. Pest proof it. So, you know, putting things like screens on windows and doors that open directly into food preparation areas to make sure that, you know, you can't have pests coming in, flying insects as well as rodents. Using electronic fly killer devices. So we do know that they, you can have moths and flies in premises. So making sure that you have controls in place for them. Checking your deliveries. This is the first point where you have control over what comes into your premises. So if you take in product that has pests in it, um, you're bringing a problem into your premises. So this is the first point where you have control over what's coming in. So important to check those deliveries coming in to make sure that they're pest free. Um, cover any food that's waiting to be prepared, keep things in sealed containers, sealed boxes, you know, make sure your storeroom is kept clean and tidy, make sure that any dry goods are maintained in a nice neat way and to make sure that no pests can get into those and keep your external areas tidy so your bin area not just throwing the plastic bags on the on the ground beside the bin make sure they go into the bin that the bin is closed and it's kept sealed that rats and mice can't get access to it so why do you need to have pest good pest control in place so one you're complying with the law and as a food business operator, that is a non-negotiable. You must comply with all the food law that, that applies to your business. The responsibility is on the food business operator to produce safe food, and part of that includes effective pest management. It protects your customers, okay? Um, you know, you wanna make sure that you're not doing anything that's gonna cause any harm to your customers. It will prevent damage to your stock. So if you have rats or mice or any of you who have had issues in the last while, you'll know the damage that a rat in a, in a dry goods storeroom can do, gnawing at bags, things like that. And then that product has to be destroyed. Um, it'll protect your reputation. Um, I'm sure you all saw a viral video over the past 12 months of a sandwich uh, prep area with a rat popping out of a bag, uh, out of a, a container of bread. It went viral, okay, and that premises was identified uh, in the press and on social media. Um, so it's very important to make sure that you're protecting your reputation. It prevents damages then to premises as well because they will gnaw through walls, they will make holes in things, they will, you know, damage cabling, etc., like that. Um, and basically, it will help you to produce safer food. So to ensure that your food that you're producing is of a suitable quality for your customers. So that's all I have to say so far this morning. So I'm going to pass over to Philip. Philip Devonish is one of the environmental health officers working in the Environmental Health Service. And Philip is, um, has lots, many years of experience, and he's going to talk to you about effective pest control and managing the pest control in your business. So over to you, Philip. So thanks very much, uh, Ruth. So as Ruth said, I'm a, an environmental health officer. I'm based in Dublin city centre and it's my job to do inspections. I'm at the sharp end and I'm going to 
go through a little bit of what the Environmental Health Service and the inspectors in particular look for in relation to pest control. So, so here's, I'm going to look at um, what are the consequences for failing to control pests, which is more of what Ruth have said. I'm going to mention briefly the legal position, I'm going to talk about responsibilities, I'm going to give you an idea of what a good pest control regime looks like, and then I'm going to finish up with some examples of when it went wrong. So hopefully you can learn from other people's mistakes without going through the pain that they went through. So what are the consequences of failing to control pests? This, so as Ruth has so eloquently put, that they, it's a number of elements to this. Um, damage to your stock and equipment and premises, damage to your reputation, disease, and you may face legal action. So just to delve into these a little bit more um, in a little bit more detail and pulling out some photographs from my own uh, personal collection. Damage to stock equipment and premises. So what we have here is a bag of flour that's been destroyed by a mouse. The mouse has chewed through the corner of it and you can see a couple of droppings there. And on the right hand side is a sack of rice. Again, it's been attacked by mice. The rice has gone everywhere and amongst the rice you can see all the all the mouse droppings. That in this particular case you can see uh, one sack of flour that's been damaged and one sack of rice but in this particular warehouse the um, there were several sacks on a pallet. Now I don't know how much these sacks cost but just in damage to these two items the food business operator may have lost several hundreds of euros because the mice they're not very sustainable. They'll chew one bag and then they'll chew a second bag. They won't wait until one bag's finished before they attack the second. You're going to get damaged to your reputation. This is a, a, a review of a website, review of a food business in Dublin. I just lifted this straight off of a TripAdvisor. And there we go. There's a, a report that there was a mouse in this particular restaurant. And just coincidentally, in the last few months, I've been investigating a couple of complaints of mice in businesses and these are um, reliable accounts from members of the public who have got in touch with me and said they've been in a business and they've seen a mouse running around and yes that was the case. They're going to spread disease so this these are cockroaches and they are underneath a service counter where food is prepared and served to members of the public. The fridge motor of this particular in this particular premises was absolutely loaded with um, cockroaches at all stages of their life cycle and what we have to remember is that these guys are covered in excrement and feces and rubbish because they come into contact with this material you know some of them will live in particularly rats and mice they may live in drains or sewers or in gaps in the building they might live in piles of rubbish and so they get coated their outside of their bodies gets coated in the in the contaminants which they then will bring into your business and run across surfaces and we've also got to remember that um, these um, pests are um, not particularly well toilet trained and they will defecate and urinate everywhere they go um, and so whilst you might see one or two mouse droppings at the edge of a counter that's not to say that they've not urinated as they've gone across that counter and the same with bags of flour or, or stock in the stock room. So what is the legal action? Uh, yes, another consequence as Ruth has already said is that you may face legal action if, um, if we identify that there's a pest problem in the premises that may present a grave and immediate danger to members of the public. So you may be faced with a closure order. This is as its name suggests, uh, an order that we would serve that requires your business to close until the problem has been eradicated. You may face prosecution. You may be forced to withdraw your product. Ruth mentioned that um, the, your first point of control is to make sure that pest, the product that you are taking in hasn't been attacked by, press, by pests. We, um, if we think that a supplier is for sending out product that is contaminated with pests, we can oblige them to withdraw that product from the market. And lastly, we can destroy product um, if we suspect that it's significant, there's significant pest damage or pest damage to the product. 
we can require that that is destroyed and sometimes depending on the nature of the product that requires specialist disposal particularly in the case of meat products and so there might be quite a cost as well as losing the value of the product there may be a cost involved in getting a, a haulier to come and remove that product and here's just one of a copy of a closure order that I served on a business um, some time ago. So what does the law say? And it's important to notice, and all the law says is that there must be adequate procedures are in place to control pests. And that's that's where it's come from, Regulation 852 of 2004. And the thing to note with this is that it isn't specific, it isn't prescriptive, and it isn't detailed. And that is as it should be, because the risks of pest attack is different in different businesses. You may, a food business may be somebody preparing cupcakes and some of you on this call may be making cupcakes in a in your house or on a third floor apartment. And the risk of your business being affected by pests is much reduced to maybe a factory that's in the middle of fields or on the edge of a canal or a river, or as I've found from time to time, uh, a food business that's operating from a say a parade of shops where the neighboring shops are vacant units that are that are inundated with pests so then we're going to move on to responsibilities and if i are so the food business operator obviously he or she has ultimate responsibility they are ultimately responsible they must train and supervise their staff including in pest control they must put systems in place now that might be appointing how a specialist within their own organization or getting a contract with a pest control company. They've got to maintain communication with employees and contractors. And, and the examples I'm going to give you in a couple of slides time will highlight where that went wrong. They've got to ensure that action is taken promptly and they must make sure that resources are in place. So that is money, as Ruth was saying, to talk about press, um, pest proofing and sealing holes, putting fly screens up. That's all got to be paid for, but resources also mean that there's time. So if somebody is responsible for deep cleaning and having a look under equipment for evidence of pests, they must be given the time to do so. But it's not only the food business operator that has this responsibility. The employee, the person working in the business also has some responsibilities. So they've got to report their suspicions. I think that this, the saying is, you know, say it, see it, sorted. Um, they've got to report what they see. They've got to ensure the food and waste is stored appropriately. If they're given the job of emptying the bins, they've got to do so in a way that when they go to the big bins out in the yard, the rubbish goes in, the lid comes down, not just dump stuff around the bins. They've got to carry out their cleaning duties effectively. It's when the kitchen porter or whoever is responsible for cleaning gets down on their hands and knees with a torch and has a good clean underneath equipment in the kitchen, that's when they may be more likely to see droppings or Nord packaging. And they have to maintain communication with the food business operator, that's FBO, and the specialist. That is the person who is responsible for um, looking for evidence of pests. Sometimes the food business operator is not on site and they are reliant on their staff to being a liaison between the contractor and the uh, and them. But the specialist, and I've used the term advisedly here because there's nothing in food law that says a contractor has to be appointed. The food business can do pest control activities themselves, but they should nominate somebody to do that work who has some sort of specialist knowledge. So the specialist, they can be a consultant or someone who is in-house, but they must, that person must be thorough. They must if they've been asked to go and look for evidence of pests, they must make sure they go into all rooms, access all parts of the building, pull out uh, stock, pull out furnishings and have a good look. Um, we had a situation not so long ago where a colleague of mine was queuing up to buy a cup of coffee and the pest control specialist, who was a contractor, visited the coffee shop, carried out their inspection, issued a report and left in the time that it took my colleague to go from say third or fourth in the queue at the barista to being served. That is not thorough. They could have only spent 10 minutes in the premises. The pest control technician must provide detailed advice and guidance. That is how they are going to maintain communication. That's how they're going to tell you what's going on. 
and they must be available to respond urgently. It's no good identifying someone who's going to be responsible for your pest control if they can only get to you um, in three or four days if you think there's a problem. So in summary, pest control is a partnership between the food business operator, the employees and the specialist, all working together to make sure there is no threat to the business of pests. So what is evidence of a good pest control regime? Well, obviously, no evidence of pests. Nothing that will attract pests, so that's soft furnishings that have been abandoned, rubbish, litter, food waste, and there's no gaps or holes. So they're the, like, the physical things that we would look for to make sure there's no evidence of pests. But on top of that, we will look for a proactive system of inspections or surveys or site visits by somebody with the knowledge and the skills. And we we'll also look for written procedures and records. These will help you prove that you've got a pest control regime in place, but also will serve as an aid memoir or instructions that you can follow. All of that needs to come together. So I'm gonna give you a couple of examples just to finish off of where it went wrong so you can learn from other people's mistakes. So the first person, I'm gonna call them the ignorer. Well, I've called them the ignorer. And what you can see in this photograph is a littering of chewed cardboard and packaging behind a pallet. So what happened here? Well, the food business operator, he ignored the technician. He had employed a pest control consultant. That pest control consultant or technician provided him with very detailed reports, telling him that he had a significant mouse problem, telling him what he needed to do to get rid of the mouse problem, um, but he ignored that technician. He also ignored his own eyes. He, he would have seen all of the, the things that we saw but he took no action. The warehouse staff in this business, they also ignored their own eyes. They took no action, even though they could see, and they probably saw mice as they were doing their duties. The mice, they were everywhere throughout this building, absolutely everywhere. And so the result was we issued him with a closure order. He had to close his business, and we decided to prosecute because he had shown really huge amounts of negligence and ignorance. He, he knew he had a problem, but he refused to do anything about it. The second example is, I'm gonna call the useless. Now that's a, this is a photograph of, of underneath of some units in a kitchen. And there are a number of black dots. You might just be able to make them out. They are a lot of mouse droppings. And so why have I said this is the useless? Well, this business had a pest control specialist. This pest control specialist visited this, this business every couple of months and each couple of months they um, wrote a report saying that there was absolutely no evidence of pests and everything was grand and indeed they had only been on site the day or two before I carried out my inspection when I went there was mouse droppings everywhere I found a dead mouse and so the pest control specialists had failed to do their duty they'd failed to do a thorough inspection and I remind you again of the example I gave you of the pest control technician in and out of a business in 10 minutes I don't know why he or she, the technician, didn't do their job, but they didn't. But I'm sure they took the money from the food business. The employees, again, they ignored what they could see. They must have seen the presence of mice all around, but not didn't take any action. The mice, they had a field day. They were everywhere. So what was the result? Well, we issued a closure order they, they, and this business lost contract. Now, in this particular case, this food business supplied food to another business down the road. They lost that contract. And also the food, the pest control technician lost his contract, as you wouldn't, as you would expect. I mean, he'd failed to do his job. So the food business operator has ultimate responsibility and they had failed to supervise um, their staff, had failed to supervise the pest control contract, and they had basically just assumed that everything was going to be grand and it wasn't. So just to finish up then, I've got some top tips for um, managing pest control in your business, plan in advance, supervise contractors or specialists. So remind them to turn up. Re usually a pest control contract will include a, re a, a number of visits per year. So it might be every two months or it might be every six weeks. And we, when we're reviewing a pest control folder at the end of the year, we might find that of the eight planned inspections for the year, the pest control technician has maybe done two. And the pest, the food business, although they're paying for this service, hadn't no, realized that the pest control technician hadn't been turning up. So really do make sure you're getting your money's worth. You are employing someone to come in and do a specialist job. 
get them to really work with you. Have your own internal systems. So know who's gonna do, who's gonna be responsible for checking for evidence of pests, for making sure there's nothing there, making sure that the pest control contract is operating. How are they gonna do that and when are they gonna do it? And the last thing is don't assume, don't assume that you will see at the early stages of an infestation and be able to take immediate action. Don't assume that you're never going to have a problem. And don't assume that your employees or the pest control technician are doing their job. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. And I've mentioned pest control technicians quite a few times. And so uh, we've got with us now Michael Lachlan from the Irish Pest Control Association, who is going to um, give you like his side, some some good advice from his side of the house. Thank you, Philip. I just can't see my screen there. Oh. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm here to talk to you briefly about uh, best practice in pest management. Uh, and I think firstly, what we need to do is to see if we can reference any agreed frameworks with regard to best practice. And uh, there is a European standard which specifies the requirements for pest management services. Uh, this standard is EN 16636 and was developed by SEN, which is the European Committee for Standardization in partnership with the European pest control industry. And uh, at IPCA, we worked with uh, NSAI uh, to contribute to its development. Uh, and of course, in addition to this, there are new regulations relating to rodenticide use, um, which must be adhered to. And this booklet on the bottom, the Crew Ireland Best Practice Requirements for Rodent Control and Safe Use of Rodenticides, uh, gives all that advice and all the regulatory, uh, states all the regulatory requirements for the use of rodenticides, and that was reissued in 2020. Within these documents and central to all pest management operations is the principle of IPM, or integrated pest management. And what that means is that we use all available methods to achieve long-term exclusion and control of pests. Um, pesticides can be used, but only if justified, and they must be used strictly in accordance with the, with labels. Um, your pest control operator then should be promoting and advising on structural and procedural modifications to exclude pests and to deny them food, water, and shelter, both inside and outside. Simply put, they must be telling you constantly how to make the site unattractive and impenetrable to pests. Effective pest management is rarely achieved without the cooperation of yourselves, the clients. Most pest occurrences result from the client not addressing the recommendations of the PCO, and it's often a, a, a matter of great frustration for pest control operators to find that they're making recommendations which aren't being carried out. And the responsibilities of both the client and the PCO should be clearly defined in the contract specification. Okay, so, um, we need to agree a site contract specification and or an, a, a service level agreement. And what should this include? Well, things like how many visits will be made to the site and, and what will be done each time, very important. And very often that just says, I'm going to call eight times, 12 times, but you need to know exactly what is the nature of the inspection. Which pests are covered in the inspection? Is he monitoring for rodents, flies, uh, ambient arthropods, the little creatures that we have on the outside of our buildings, cockroaches, ants, stored products. So exactly what does the pest control service level agreement cover? If rodent monitors are used, what type are they? If rodents are identified, what is the elimination procedure? Uh, is there a follow-up procedure or a follow-up schedule? 
uh, what's the fly control uh, strategy uh, and is there a reporting system for, for flying insect in ingress? All of these should be listed on a site contract specification or an SLA. Given the serious consequences arising from infestation, monthly assessment is adequate in most situations. And this is not just about checking boxes. Um, the PCO should be reporting on uh, any signs of pests or any conditions present which may give rise uh, to the entry and establishment of pests. Should be looking at raw materials and, and, and the production process. The external site, food, is there food, water and shelter, the main supports for, uh, for rodent infestation in particular? Uh, an inspection of the external site and reporting, constantly reporting on its condition, sanitation, bins, etc. And in urban areas, the situation with regard to drains, because we know that from the drainage systems and, and, and the sewer mains, uh, you know, rats are very happy down there. There's no, there's no competitors. They have, it's warm all year round. And uh, drains, the, the, the PCO should know about the link between drains and particularly rat infestation where they can move from sub uh, underground uh, drainage systems to the, the surface. Remember that six millimeters is all it takes to, for a, a mouse to gain entry into a premises and 13 for a rat. Um, does he check feeling spaces and dead spaces? And are there access problems for him when he goes into a storage area? and uh, he, he needs to do a wall floor junction inspection and there's, there's, there's packaging and materials stacked in such a way that to block his access. Internal hygiene, order and cleanliness, these are all extremely important. And as mentioned before, the responsibilities for the client and the PCO should be clearly defined in the SLA. A very useful piece of documentation is a, uh, a recommendation sign-off log uh, to make sure that all recommendations are being dealt with. Um, okay, rodent monitoring devices then. Um, traditional rodent pest monitoring involved the permanent placement of rodenticide baits, uh, and this was used as a monitoring system, and this is no longer permitted. So wh when we talk about rodent monitoring, by far the most important tool to monitor for rodents is the visual inspection and usually by the use of a uh, by use of a flashlight an in-depth inspection is absolutely crucial you've got to get down underneath you've got to uh, uh, inspect beneath fixtures and fittings you've got to look into ceiling voids you've got to look into dead spaces plant rooms and areas not often used um, and um, this is by far by far the most important element um, he may decide to use um, other types of monitoring devices. For instance, he may use trapping systems. Uh, there's a small trap called a snappy trap, which is a box trap with indi uh, little indicating devices on them to, to indicate activation. And, and these can be checked weekly or more often uh, uh, by just looking at the box and you can see whether the flag is actually flying or not. Um, Non-toxic bait, of course, is another one which has to be used very, very carefully because non-toxic bait in itself is a food. Um, motion sensors or e-traps, they can be quite expensive and they may not offer any practical advantage on the ordinary mechanical box traps. But all devices need to be mapped and dated. And just to reiterate, the most important uh, is, the, is the visual inspection. If you see your PCO uh, using a flashlight, you know he's do, he's certainly on the road to doing a good job so if defenses are breached and you have rodents inside what can be expected well you know trapping is probably giving you the best option for faster removal and an intensive focused trapping program is probably the best way to deal with the appearance sudden appearance of of rodents inside Remember that rodenticides can take as much as eight days to kill a rodent. Now, if you are using a rodenticide inside to deal with a, a, an infestation, uh, over a period of eight days, while the, while the, the rodent is act, still active, 
uh, he can he or she can do an awful lot of, of contamination. Um, so trapping is probably the best, an intensive focused trapping program. Rodenticides must be used, if they're going to be used, must be used according to the product label and the instructions uh, uh, on the, the crew code of practice and the instructions on the label itself. For external use, if uh, rodenticide is being used externally, it, there must be a record of environmental risk assessment. When checks are being done, of course, the, 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 uh, uh, the PCO should ensure that any existing droppings or any other damage that has been caused by rodents is removed so that on the, at the beginning of the next inspection, he knows that it's all, it's all new uh, evidence. And I suppose the bottom line is that if you don't have, from a, 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 a legal point of view, if you don't have rodents on your site, you should have no rodenticides. Okay, let's uh, talk for a moment about fly control then. Fly control, we can we can say it can be divided into two areas of operation primary control and secondary control primary control means um really making sure that the external parts of of your site are not attracting flies in the first instance and that would include things like ensuring that your bins are solid they're working they're closed and um, that there's no spillage uh, that you don't have blocked uh, or overflowing gullies or drains, which can give rise to um, some uh, uh, fly populations. Um, installation and maintenance of fly screens, Philip has mentioned them, Ruth has mentioned them, they're extremely important, but there's no point in putting them up just for decoration. You have to make sure that they're functioning properly, that they're forming a complete seal all around, and that your PCO should re be reporting on their condition, that they're doing their job, and, he should, and your PCO should be doing that as a matter of, uh, of importance. Then secondary fly control. These are what we call EFKs or insect light traps, ILTs. And um, you have to consider their limitations. They are primarily monitoring devices because it can take many hours for flies to enter these EFK units and of course the responses vary from one species to another. But just for an example, at, at four meters, which is considered to be the capture zone, it will take up to seven hours for 90% of flies to enter the machine. In 36 hours, 99% of them will have responded. So if you consider that, I saw some recent research that 1,000 uh, CFUs can be transferred every time a fly lands on a surface. Uh, that means that it's uh, that a fly is going to be around, landing on surfaces, landing on food for a long time before it actually entered these machines. So we've got to make sure that we're using them to their maximum. Are they correctly positioned for maximum effect? Your 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 PCO should be able to advise you on the correct positioning. The general principle of sighting is to intercept flies before they enter critical areas, and those that don't. Uh, uh, sorry, those that do are attracted away from products towards EFKs. Are your EFKs serviced in March, April, to give to make sure that that the 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 new uh, UVA tube is working to its maximum effect over the flying insect season? Are they cleaned properly and zeroed? In other words, are the trays or glue boards cleaned every time? Uh, or on a regular schedule, at least throughout the flying insect season. Are you getting accurate and tray or board counts? Very important that you're actually taking some measures from these devices to make sure, because after all, what they're doing is they're letting you know how good or how bad your primary control is. Um, are you getting species uh, significance reports? Um, if you're finding lots of moth fly, or fruit fly, or scuttle fly, or lesser dung fly in these, they may be indicating poor hygiene or block drains inside. And uh, you know your PCO should be able to recognize that and give you a report and give you advice on how to, how to deal with the situation. Bottom line for these units is always use them to divert flies away from sensitive areas. So, Let's have a look at uh, just a couple of insect pets, pests that may be encountered in a food business. 
cockroaches. Um, cockroaches are, are usually introduced on incoming packaging and goods. You've heard Ruth mention this before. Um, they, have, they undergo incomplete metamorphosis, which means that tiny, tiny versions called nymphs uh, are uh, hatched from the UTK or the egg cases. So they find it very, very easy to hide, particularly in, in cardboard corrugated packaging. But it's, it's important that your staff know that if you're getting in uh, packaging that's likely to be in, in, uh, to carry cockroach nymphs or cockroach UTK or even adult cockroaches, that they're given some kind of an inspection when they come in. Anyway, your PCO should be doing a good in-depth inspection so that he would pick up the presence of cockroach nymphs or, or UTK at an early stage. Um, baiting programs give the best results. In, 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 uh, also, you've got to use adhesive traps like hoi hoi traps uh, are, are very good. I know there are other types out there as well, which contain food attractants and possibly some aggregation pheromone to, to, to ca capture uh, uh, cockroaches. So you're using them in tandem with your baiting program. And what they can do, what the, what the, um, the, the monitors can do, is to give you an indication of how good your program is working. In other words, you should be, you know, over a period of time, as the baiting is continuing, you should see a reduction in the number of cockroaches and in the various stages of the cockroaches turning up on these traps. Uh, and of course, yes, this will indicate the success of baiting. And your PCO should also be able to identify the species and know the characteristic differences between the, the various species of cockroach. Uh, a look at, just very quickly, uh, uh, two insects that, again, may turn up in a food business. The pharaoh's ant, which is a tropical ant, uh, and the black garden ant, which is a, a, a native ant, and, and can come in foraging for food. And by, there really is no need, and very rarely a need, to use insecticidal spraying these days. Uh, ant gel baits are very focused, they are less risk, and they're much more effective in the long term. So it, you shouldn't be seeing, again, your PCO should be advising you and should know what the best methods are for bringing them under control if they come in. Um, and stored product against insects then, these are business specific pests of whole grain cereals, nuts, dried fruits and pulses, and they should be identified initially when you're drawing up your, your SLA and your PCO should tell you exactly how he's going to monitor this situation. And he can discuss with you what type of active monitoring devices. These will be devices that contain pheromones for, for, for attracting males. And we're usually talking about either, either um, um, moths, stored product moths, or stored product beetles. And these monitoring devices can be very helpful in, uh, in figuring out the, the profile of a particular infestation and uh, making sure that, uh, or giving indications of whether they exist or not. And of course, keeping population trend analyses is, is important here as well. And then finally, the site records, they should contain the following. Your, your PCO should have a PMU registration number with the Department of Agriculture to show that he has gone through the regulatory training, the trade association membership, insurance, health and safety risk assessments, the environmental risk assessments for odenticide use externally, safe systems of work, map of monitoring devices, a recommendations log, which I, I've mentioned before is a very useful piece of, of uh, a record, um, service reports, of course, copies of all the service reports, including absolutely everything uh, that he has noted during his inspection, pesticide labels, uh, pesticide usage records, and checklists and trends. And I think that's about it from me for now. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, Michael, and also a huge thanks to Philip and Ruth. So now we have some time just for a few questions. So if your speak the speakers would like to come back on, that'd be great. So we do we do have lots of questions, and any that I don't get to because we're we're tight for time at the moment, you can email info at fsai.ie and we'll come back to you um with, with an answer. So first of all, just gonna have a little look here. Um this is a popular one, and I think I know the answer to this one. This is probably for Ruth. Does the FCI have a list of pest control contractors? So Ruth, 
Um, I'm not sure if uh, we're, we're actually we're able to do that to, to give out a list. Yeah. You might, might fill us no, in. Um, we don't recommend one or endorse one pest control contractor over another. Um, we do advise that you go through the information. Michael has given very good information there as to what you would be looking for from a good pest control contractor. Um, you know, it's definitely worth uh, checking out, talking to a few of them. And, you know, maybe to, um, you know, check, can you get a recommendation from somebody else that you know that uses them? Are they happy with them? Will they give you a client to give you a reference, uh, to give them a reference or something like that? And then once you do decide on a pest control contractor, as a food business operator, it's up to you to ensure that they're doing their job. You're paying them good money for a service and you need to make sure that they're providing that service. And I think in Michael's talk and in Philip's talk as well, both of them have touched on what you would be looking for there. Great, thanks very much, Ruth. Um, another question here, and I think this is probably for for Michael. Um, through your observations, has the instant uh, has the incident of pests increased since the change in regulations and not allowing toxic bait internally? Uh, anecdotally, I don't I don't think there has been any well managed um, uh, investigation, but anecdotally, there doesn't seem to have been any major increase. Uh, be, be, because of the change from the use of toxic bait. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and this one, it might be, it might be for Philip here. Philip, I think you've probably, you might have covered this a little, but I'll, I'll just, I'll put it out there anyway. So, what are the biggest pitfalls when it comes to good pest control? So, the biggest, the biggest problems are a failure to really react, as I gave in the examples. It's so. He, he, the food business operator will identify or should be aware that there's problems on site. And I don't actually mean an immediate pest infestation, but there might be gaps, holes, um, accumulations of waste, and they do nothing about it. They don't, um, I think they assume that the problem will go away or they'll deal with it next month and then it just gets worse and worse. Uh, and then, as I think we've all said a few times, it's the failure to manage the pest control regime in whichever form it's, it's, it takes place. And the failure to, either the failure to communicate with the technician or the pest control op operative, or their, the pest control operative's failure to actually provide a good level of service for whatever reason. But that, that then comes down to a failure to, to communicate with them and require of them a good service. Okay, great, thanks very much, Philip. Um, this one is, has come in a few times, actually. Can I carry out my own pest control instead of having a pest control contractor do it? Shall I take that? Yeah, yeah. go, yeah. go ahead, Phil. Yeah. You, you can. Uh, there's nothing in food law that um, says uh, you have to employ a contractor or a consultant, but you need to be satisfy yourself that you've got the skills the ability and the time to do it and then if if you do do it yourself you must know who you'll contact if the problem looks it's look if you identify a problem but then if you're trying to do something more intense then that's when you need to start getting a specialist in and you also do have to have regard to all of the other um restrictions on the use of rodenticides and that kind of stuff that you, that a pest control specialist will know I think there's also a training course that you have to go through to be able to handle the pesticides, the rodenticides. So I don't know, maybe Michael, you want to come in since the change in the rodenticide rules. Um, there's a training course for people carrying out pest control who aren't a pest control contractor. Am I right? Yes, Ruth, there is. But, you know, I must mention that amateur products are still available on the market. They are restricted. So if somebody decided that they wanted to do a rodenticide treatment, uh, they can be still be, be uh, they're still available on the market. Am amateur uh, rodent or rodenticides that are on the market for amateur use uh, would be restricted in size and restricted in strength. So it may not be uh, it may not be worthwhile to spend the you know the level of uh, the amount of money that you would need to to buy an appropriate amount of that stuff. Um, but and, and again, trapping can be done by anybody. Uh, but they need to uh, they need to have a look at the best practice requirements, which are some really good guidelines on the use of traps. Um, and then, Ruth, if you know if you want to become 
um, you know, the next group of users of, of rodenticides would be the professionals. They would be people like farmers, and they can use rodenticides, uh, but they can, they can only use them under some circumstances. They can't be used away from buildings in open areas or in sewers. Um, uh, and then the there is a training course, which is uh, the Lantra Level 3, which is actually a training course for uh, for the professional pest control industry. Um, and in reality, anybody could do it if they wanted to educate themselves and to get a Lantra certificate. And that will give training, not just in the use of rodenticides, but in, in right across the whole range of, of uh, pest control uh, for both vertebrate and invertebrate pests. Yeah, and I think I, I inquired with the Pest Control Service in the Department of Agriculture, and they would consider a food business operator that is doing their own pest control in a food premises, not talking about the level, the, the third floor apartment, uh, business from home kind of thing, that they would, they regard them as a, a trained professional user for their own use. So it's restricted, they can only use it for their own use and they would have to do that Lantra course that Michael has they, mentioned. They, yeah, they do the first uh, two modules of that Lantra yeah. course. Um, and to, so there would be a, a theoretical uh, element to it and a practical element. And if they do that, then they get what's called an on-site PMU registration. Yeah, yeah. Great. Th thanks very much to the, the three of you for answering that question. That's uh, that's really useful. So look, I'm conscious we're, we're over time here um, and apologies for that, but we might just touch on one more question and then and then we'll close. So finally, um, Philip, you might expand on this a little bit. I know you touched on it already. Um, I keep my yard and premises really clean and neat, but my neighbouring premises doesn't. What can I do? Um, that's... It's, it's very difficult to, you can only control what you can control. Um, pests are out in the environment anyway, so you must do as much as you possibly can to keep them out of your building. I'm assuming that you're not, no part of your food preparation takes place in the yard. If there's, there, there, there can be problems and we have separate pieces of legislation for dealing with rats and mice on land. It's very old legislation. It's 105 years old now or 104 um, but that requires people to keep their land and premises free from rats and mice the disadvantage of it is that failure to comply with that legislation results in a i think it's a five an old five pound fine so i would speak to the local eho um, to see if there's any way that they can help you um, take action against the the neighboring neighboring building Great, thanks very much, Philip. That's that's brilliant. So look, apologies to those of you who sent in questions that we didn't get to answer. As I said, if you email them to info at fsai.ie, we'll get back to you. So the key messages we'd like to take away from this webinar are you must have an effective pest control program in place in your food business. Prevention is key. If you see something, say something. And as Philip mentioned, effective pest control is a partnership between the business and the pest contractor. So we regularly run a number of free events for small food businesses, and you might be aware of these already. If you're interested in attending similar events, you can subscribe to our event alerts, fsai.ie forward slash subscribe, and we'll pop a link in the chat, and you'll receive a notification as soon as registration opens for all of our events. So after this, a survey will launch, and we really appreciate your feedback. It'll help us create future events suited to your needs. So thanks so much again to Ruth, Philip and Michael for speaking and also a huge thanks to my colleague Elaine in the background. And again, thank you all for tuning in this morning. Take care.